Now you're probably thinking, well, this should be interesting. <laughs> it will be. It will be. Especially if you're familiar with uh, Proverbs chapter 7 and the subject matter. Uh, it will be. And so I have an older brother, uh, two years older than me. And when we were little, my mom bought us some slingshots to pass the uh, time in the summer. And now she gave us slingshots with a simple, clear set of instructions. Don't shoot animals. Don't shoot the house and don't shoot people. Fair enough. So we shot the fence. We shot tin cans. We shot the sky. Yes, I know what goes up must come down, but I was 12, so how am I supposed to know that? <laughs> well, one summer day, my mom was going to take a nap, and so she took the slingshots away from us and put them up high. Now, my mom is 5'2", so high really isn't high. <laughs> and once we felt like she was good and asleep, uh, we reached up there, grabbed them, and then ran outside for some tomfoolery. We both started on one side of the yard, aiming at leaves, any sort of insect that we could find. And slowly but surely, though, as we looked for more ammo, we moved you know, away from each other, picking up things from the ground until we were on the opposite side of the yard from each other. Our eyes met, and we knew exactly what was about to go down. <laughs> After quizzing a couple of shots by each other, my brother made first contact, a blow-the-belt shot, that I felt crossed the line. Uh, so I was looking to retaliate, and I found the perfect rock. I aimed it for his midsection, and right when I turned it loose, he bent down to pick up a rock himself. My perfect projectile was now traveling at a high rate of speed, straight for his face. I don't remember the sound that it made when it hit his eye and eye socket, but I do remember the sound that he made. He grabbed his face, and he screamed like a banshee. I ran over there to see what I could do, and he screamed, go get mom. Made sense. So I ran inside to my parents' bedroom where I found my mother sleeping. And I thought, maybe there's another way. <laughs> because I realized at that point, I was about to get into an incredible amount of trouble if I woke her up and told her just what happened. So I slowly backed away with the intent of going back outside to talk to my brother and see if we could work this out, that no one would have to know. Well, when I made it to the back door, I was met by my older brother who was standing there with blood all down the side of his face and on his shirt. He said, never mind, I'll do it. I stood there with my mouth open wide as he passed by me, headed to wake up my mom. He woke her up. I heard lots of commotion and confusion, and I saw them make their way to the bathroom. Upon entering the bathroom, my brother looked in the mirror and saw with his other eye all the blood, and he passed out. Once he hit the ground, my mom slumped down the side of the wall and passed out too. I cautiously approached the crime scene and stopped <laughs> looking down at the mess I'd created. And I was incredibly, incredibly sad and incredibly, incredibly scared. I was sad because of the pain I had caused. And I was scared because of the pain that was coming for me. My dad was going to be home any minute. I was given a simple, clear set of instructions, but I thought I could get away with disobedience. I thought no one would know that the fun would be worth the risk. That's one of the reasons why I love the book of Proverbs. It's simple, clear instruction. Here's what you want to do. Here's what you don't want to do. If you do this, this could happen. If you do this, this might happen. For the most part, it's black and white, and I love it. You can separate your Old Testament into three distinct sections. Historic, pro poetic, and prophetic. There's 17 historic books. 17 prophetic books sandwiched in between are five poetic books. Now, you'll find a little bit of each genre in each section, but for the most part, if you know the idea of where you're at, uh, what category you're reading, then you know what book your, your reading falls into. Proverbs uh, is in the poetic section, and it's smack dab in the middle, and it's kind of like a Brazilian steakhouse. Have you ever been to a Brazilian steakhouse before? They continually feed you meat there, and lots of it. Not confusing dishes where you have to ask, what is this? I don't understand. <laughs> Just straightforward meat. You're dig digesting one course, and it's obvious what it is because they told you, and you can see, but then they bring out more meat. You're not done digesting that round, and then here comes another to your plate and another. And it's all good. That's Proverbs. Each verse is practically a meal in itself. 
You're working through one morsel of wisdom, and here comes another, and another, and another. It's really pretty awesome. But chapter 7 is a little different, though, because the focus is on one subject. It's a porterhouse. It's still in poetic flow, but the focus is on one thing, not multiple things throughout the chapter. Let's take a look. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Proverbs 7. I'm going to read it for us. Uh, if you don't have them, that's okay. It'll be on the screen behind me. And you can bring your Bible next to it. <laughs> All right, chapter 7. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and, and he, take the, he takes the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. Today I have paid my vows. Therefore I have come to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. The, for the, husband, the man is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool. Until an arrow pierces through his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare. So he does not know that it will, it will cost him his life. Now, therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Welcome to the brook. <laughs> so, now you might be sitting here thinking, I'm not sure this is going to pertain to me, but it will. I bet you can find yourself in Proverbs 7 before we're done. Solomon addresses a subject uh, that he touched on in earlier chapters. He's going to expand on it in chapter 7 because of the importance of it, and also the importance of his audience as well. Solomon spends a good portion of his day holding court, sharing wisdom with the people of Jerusalem, the tribe of Judah, the nation of Israel, the surrounding nations and their royalty when they come to visit. Everybody stood to benefit from listening to Solomon. But here, in chapter 7, it starts with an audience of one, his son. While the text doesn't name Rehoboam, that's Solomon's only recorded son, and it would make sense that it's Rehoboam because he's next in line for the kingship. So he's invested in him. It also makes sense, if you read about Rehoboam, you know that he needed all the wisdom he could get. He preferred to listen to his friends versus his fathers or the elders, his father or the elders. He was a terrible king, and that led to Israel being divided into two kingdoms. If you have a child that doesn't listen to you, at least they're not going to split a nation in half, most likely. All right, starting in verse 1. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Solomon's commandments are God's commandments. His wisdom comes from God. So when he's sharing like this, he's speaking in God's name. Verse 2 uh, it says, my teaching is the apple of your eye. It means it's something you protect. The word apple is in the verse is translated from the Hebrew word ishon, which means pupil. Literally, the delicate center portion of your eye. Your eyes are an exposed organ, and so it's something valuable and it's something worth protecting. My brother got to keep the eye, by the way, uh, if you're wondering. I immediately sent him in the glasses, but he got to keep the eye, so there's that. Bind them on your fingers is a reference to rings, like a signet ring or a wedding band. It's something that is a reminder of who you are and a symbol of who you are with. If a binding on your finger is an external picture of what you treasure, the tablet of your heart is an internal one. It's something much deeper than a ring. I take my ring off, I'm still married. 
I still act the way I should because internally my commitment, my treasure, is written on my heart. It's something I protect. Verse 4. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend. Both of these are close relationships. People that you know well and are intimately acquainted with. People you seek counsel from. People that you remember and think fondly of. That's what he wants wisdom and understanding to be for his son. A relationship that is close, not one that you call to check in on once a year. What I'm telling you, son, is I want you to value what I tell you and keep it with you, always. Why? Verse 5. That they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. So here Solomon is going to transition from generic wisdom of verses 1 through 4, which he starts off with in a lot of the other chapters, to specific reasoning in verse 5. This is why you should listen to me, that you might stay away from the adulteress and the foreign woman. So Solomon is going to expand on this subject because Israel has a long history with adultery and foreign prostitutes. They have a problem, and it's a problem that has continually destroyed what God has set aside for his purpose. In speaking to Israel through Moses in, in Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 26, it'll be up here. Uh, God says, Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord am, uh, I the, uh, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. God wanted Israel to be different, not like the surrounding nations. And the quickest way for Satan to destroy what God had set aside was through what we're talking about here. This connecting we'll say, with foreign women and prostitutes would immediately destroy families and bloodlines, bring in false idol worship into camp, and tear down what God was trying to build up. So this is a time in our story that if you're seeing the painted picture with Solomon and his son on the court steps, his audience might get a little uneasy because he brings up prostitution, adultery. It's where Rehoboam's eyes might look you know, back and forth like, is anybody listening to this, or is it just me and dad? So it's an uncomfortable subject. But it's an important subject, and Solomon is going to present it in a poetic story format with two main characters that are nameless. Why? I mean, he had personal stories he could tell. Who was Solomon's father? King David. His father started an adulterous relationship that eventually produced Solomon. His mother was Bathsheba. He also had half-brothers in Amnon and Absalom who made some terrible decisions that led to some horrific, horrific immorality. Solomon was certainly familiar with foreign wives. He had plenty, and they would be his downfall later. Different subject, different time. But he didn't use any of those personal examples to drive home the point. He told a story instead. You pull out all the stops as a parent or as a mentor for kids, your kids, and you try and help them make the right decisions. You tell them what they should do, whether they want to hear it or not. Maybe you ask your parents to help influence them too. Maybe you talk to their mentor or their youth pastor. Anybody that has an influence in their life, hey, can you touch on this subject because we're having some issues at home? Maybe you show them a movie that communicates what you've been trying to tell them for five years. You try to reach them any way possible, and that's what any good parent or mentor would do, and that's what Solomon is doing here. Verse 6. For at the window of my house, I look out through my lattice, which, it's ironic, No. Solomon paints a picture of himself looking down from the king's quarters at night, and he sees the calamity that's about to take place at a distance. His father, King David, looked out from his king's quarters at night, and he brought the calamity to the palace. I digress. Verse 7, And I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense. Here we see our first character in the story, and we get a description of him. He's naive, he's young, and he's lacking sense. Not exactly how you'd want to be described, but it's who Proverbs are for. Remember verse 4 in the first chapter of Proverbs? Proverbs 1, 4. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. Proverbs are for everyone, but they're incredibly helpful when you're young and naive. Verse 8. Passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. Did you count the red flags? Sometimes it's amazing how many wrong turns you have to take before you can make it to your final bad decision destination. He could have peeled off at any time and gone back, but he didn't. And the further he went, the darker it got. Proverbs 6.23 says, For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is life. 
The very things that Solomon is trying to convey to his son would have brought clarity and light to a dark situation. Have you ever invested in somebody and mentored them, or mentored them and they just don't listen? They seemingly insist on learning the hard way, on going out into the night without a lamp. It feels like all you can do is watch from afar, from a window, and say to yourself, don't do it. Don't go that way. My family has some land north of Dallas, and when we, we camped there a lot when I was little, and it was far enough from civilization that at nighttime it would be just pitch black. You could not see anything. And one thing my dad said we were not supposed to do is go out at night without a lamp. The main reason was the cows. Not only were you likely to step in something that they left behind, but you very well might encounter the bull, and the bull did not like surprises. Well, I went out without a lamp once, and it's terrifying as a 10-year-old being far away from the cabin, standing there doing your business before bedtime, and then suddenly you see eyes looking back at you, glowing in the dark. And then those same eyes start bouncing up and down, meaning they're running <laughs> towards you, and then they start bouncing faster. And so you start running yourself back towards the cabin, towards safety, and then you hear the bell. There's only one with a bell. It's the bull. And the bell is getting closer, closer and closer. You really only have to make that mistake once to learn a lesson. But... If I had listened and taken a lamp, I wouldn't have to learn that lesson uh, firsthand about light at all. I could just listen. And now we're going to get introduced to our second character, and we're going to get a description of her. Starting in verse 10. And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. Doesn't sound like the type of girl you'd bring home to mom, does it? My pastor in college used to say, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with girls that do. <laughs> I married my wife anyway. <laughs> I'm kidding. She's very sweet. If you know her, you know she doesn't smoke or drink. <laughs> but this character in our story is bold. She's loud. She's defiant. She's wild. And she's deceitful. In fact, this woman we are introduced to is the polar opposite of a woman that will be described later in Proverbs in chapter 31. Let's have a look at just some of the differences. So in Proverbs 7, she's dressed as a harlot. Proverbs 31, strength and dignity are her clothing. Proverbs 7, her feet do not remain at home. Proverbs 31, her lamp does not go out at night. Proverbs 7, she is boisterous, boisterous and rebellious. Proverbs 31, she opens her mouth in wisdom. So the contrast between the women we see in Proverbs 7 and the woman that is described in Proverbs 31 are stark to say the least. Instantly, Proverbs 7, it's a father communicating to his son. Proverbs 31, uh, it's a recollection of a, of a mom uh, conveying who you should look for to her son. And so it's super cool, and you should look at the, uh, compare the chapters later this week when you have the time, and then fire me off a text on another thing. Incidentally, have you ever heard the word lurk before used in a positive way? I mean, no one lurks admirably, right? Where's your date? Oh, he's lurking behind that tree. <laughs> it doesn't work. Right? Creepy things lurk. Predators lurk. She lurks. And she's lurking in the streets and in the squares. What else is in the streets and the squares? Remember chapter one? Wisdom is. Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. It's not too late at this point. Wisdom is there, too, to make, the right, to make the right decision. Verse 13. So she seizes him and kisses him. So here we're going to see how sexual temptation works, the strategies it employs. It will make a series of appeals until the target either gives in or flees. First, she's got to make the most basic appeal, to touch. She seizes him and kisses him. She's aggressive which sometimes is the only appeal needed. You're standing so close to the edge of the cliff, all it takes is someone to push you just a little bit, and it's over. You may have stood close to the edge hoping someone would. Let's continue. And with a brazen face, she says, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. Excuse me, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I've paid my vows. So next, she's going to make an appeal to taste. What? No, she didn't, Ryan. She's talking about peace offerings and vows. Well, 
Israel was under law, and you had different types of law, civil law, moral law, ceremonial law. The peace offerings she, she is talking about fall under ceremonial or sacrificial law. You see, the vast majority of the time when a blood sacrifice is made under ceremonial law, you offered up the entire animal. It was killed and it was burnt. A portion might go to the Levitical priest, but none would get to you because it was your sacrifice. With peace offerings, you could take some of the meat home to prepare and eat and fellowship that day. So by telling him that she had made peace offerings, she is telling him, one, I'm a good girl. I obey the law. And two, I can prepare a meal for you because I have leftover meat for my sacrifice. She makes an appeal to taste, to his stomach. She's got pulled pork. Actually, <laughs> civil law, actually, dietary law, she doesn't. And so it's probably brisket. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Um, but so she appeals to his stomach, but surely that's not enough, right? Who would give up so much for a meal? Well, remember Esau? He gave up the, his birthright, his firstborn, to his brother Jacob for some of the red stuff. Genesis 25, 29 through 33 should be up here. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there for I am famished. Therefore, his name uh, was called Edom. The Edomites were going to come from Esau. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. Drama. <laughs> so what use of this then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold him uh, his birthright to Jacob. What about Israel? Remember, frequently they wanted to go back to Egypt. So because even though they were enslaved, at least they served lunch there. Hunger is one of the things you have to be careful of when making decisions. It can lead you astray. How about you? Have you ever bought something you didn't need because you went to the store when you were hungry? All the time, right here. I didn't need the big wheel of cheese at Costco, but I was hungry, and it looked good. Verse 15, therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly. I have found you. Next, temptation is going to make an appeal to what he hears. She's going to pretend he's something special, as though she's been looking for someone like him all of her life, and she's finally found him. Proverbs 5.3 says, For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. It would make you feel good, though, right? That this woman who had passed by all the other men in town to get to you, and you might even buy it. So what you can hear can influence your decision-making. You ever go to a small town restaurant and the waitress, who's been there 40 plus years, says in a southern accent, what can I get you for dessert, honey? You sit up a little straighter, and before you know it, you're ordering cobbler that you didn't want at all because someone called you honey and showed you a little attention. The enemy, the enemy will use words to sway you in your decision making and in your direction. With respect to words, not that that waitress was the enemy, she was, this was a cobbler. With respect to words, a quick side note, I know men have the reputation in society of wanting what this woman is eventually uh, going to be offering here, but words carry a huge amount of weight. Guys want three things, respect, encouragement, and appreciation. All three of those things can be achieved through words. That one's free. Next, verse 16. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. Egypt was known for lots of things, one of them being their ability to make luxurious fabrics. It's still being leveraged as a concept today. Pick up something. Oh, these have Egyptian cotton. They look nice. <laughs> now she makes an appeal to what he sees. She's using the coverings, the linens, to make something appear nicer than it is, to cover up what's underneath, to give the visual that there's nothing seedy here. In fact, this is high end. You should feel comfortable, even honored by what you see. Sin makes an appeal to sight, to visually tell you it's okay. Verse 17, I've sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. What's that? It's the ingredients of a pumpkin spice latte. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now she makes an appeal to what he smells, presenting a pleasant fra fragrance as a distraction, a distraction from what, he's re what is really happening, from reality. It's the kitchen candle uh, in the kitchen. Excuse me, it's the kitchen candle after cooking fish and broccoli. It's bathroom potpourri. Have you ever heard uh, had your judgment clouded by smell? I bet you have. Have you ever gone out to eat and then to a movie afterwards? You eat a full meal, you're stuffed, you don't even want to consider looking at the dessert menu, you're so full. But when you get to the movie theater, what happens? 
You smell the buttery popcorn. And you say, let's get a bucket of popcorn. <laughs> you didn't want it. You don't need it. But then suddenly you had to have it. So she appe she's appealed to touch, taste, hearing, sight, and smell. What are those? All five senses. And that's the way sexual temptation works. The way the enemy works. Any angle, every angle. Verse 18, come, let us drink uh, our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. Now we have the proposition. If he, if he hasn't been picking up what she's been laying down yet, she's going to spell it out for him in black and white. This is what I'm here for. So she's made her appeals, and she's been direct with her desire, but there is something that can trump all those, those senses and that proposition. You know what it is? Reason, the final hurdle. The ability to be enticed by all these things and still say, mm, this is too dangerous. This isn't right. I'll pass. So she's going to make a plea to reason or logic. Let's have a look. Verse 19. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him, and at the full moon, he will come home. There it is. The final strategy is going to be, it, the final strategy is going to secure his folly. He can look up at the sky and see whatever phase the moon is in and think, I'm in the clear. Temptation will tell you that you won't get caught, that no one will know. That's the final persuasion, that no one will find out. No one will get hurt. It's not going to go beyond this moment, this time. That's not the way it works, though, is it? Proverbs 6, 27, 28. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? Robbie's spoken about this before, about how you don't get to plant a crop and not reap the harvest of what you planted. There will be a price to pay for not listening to sound wisdom, to God's teaching, and going your own way, even if you think no one will see you. Because Proverbs uh, chapter 5, verse 21, For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. You're not alone. You never were alone. Verse 21, she, with her many persuasions, she entices him. And with her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly, he follows her. Any hope he had to resist is over. You don't nuzzle up to sin and see if you can resist. You don't get as close to the line as possible and then say, okay, that's enough. I'm going home. You can't afford to do that. That's not what the Apostle Paul called the church at Corinth to do. What do you tell them? You flee. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Real quick, just to provide some context to that verse, uh, the church at Corinth had fallen to sexual immorality because they adopted a mindset that didn't matter what they did with their bodies since they were no, lo no longer under Old Testament law that they could eat anything they wanted and not be a problem for their bodies. So why not this area too? It not also not be a problem for their bodies. They're confusing moral law and dietary law. Paul is telling them to flee because unlike other sins or previous areas of law, sexual sin is something that scars you, scars that you can take, that you take with you. So flee from it. Remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife in Genesis 29? What did he do when she propositioned him? He ran. He, didn't, he fled. He didn't stay to talk it out. He ran. doesn't matter what it looks like. You run. We speak about Israel being chosen and set aside, but if you're a Christian, you are too. You are bought with a price and set apart to be holy, to glorify God in the time you have here on earth. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. God wants to protect us. He wants us to protect what he has set aside for his glory, his will. So flee. If not, here's how Solomon's going to conclude his story. We continue in verse 22. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or in one in fetters to the discipline of a fool, until an arrow pierces through his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare. So he does not know that it will cost him his life. He doesn't know that this simple decision is going to cost him everything. He's naive, remember? He's simple. He's young. And he can't stop the repercussions at this point. It's too late. Oxen are big, strong animals. 
How do you get an ox from here to there? With a ring through their nose. Get that in and you can lead them anywhere, even to their death. Much like an ox is going to the, uh, much like an ox going to the slaughter pen, if a bird knew that a snare would kill them, they wouldn't fly into it. But once they do, you can't stop what happens next. If you were shot with an arrow in the liver 3,000 years ago, you're going to die. I probably would today. <laughs> but for sure back then. When I was looking down at my brother and my mother on the floor of the bathroom that day, I was incredibly sorry for the decision I had, met, I had made to disobey. Not just because of the person I had hurt, but because the consequences were all just now starting. There was no going back. The repercussions of my actions couldn't be stopped and I would have to endure whatever it might be starting right then. If you've experienced the pain of mistakes before or you see it possibly happening to those close to you, those that you love, you can be a bit more adamant in your speech when warning others. So here Solomon transitions. Now therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Verse 24 is where if it was me, there would be a furrowed brow and a finger snout. As far as I told you the story, now listen. All right? And also it says my sons. And so the, the subject matter has drawn a bigger audience. Go figure. But if it was me, it would be a furrowed brow of like, listen to me. This is important. And Solomon is going to summarize the lesson for them. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Remember the first part of verse 2 at the start of the chapter, Sol Solomon's admonition? Keep my commandments and live. And my teaching is the apple of your eye. Keep my commandments and live. Proverbs 7, 2, the very, the very start. The picture can't be any more black and white. Do this and live. Do this and die. It's clear and it's direct. I mentioned earlier that you're never alone. It's true. And because of that, it's never too late to reach out to God. Don't subscribe to the faulty thinking of, it's too late. I've messed up. I've gone this far. It's not. If you're a Christian, cry out for help when you've headed down, into, you're headed into the dark without a lamp. Cry out to God. Cry out to your community. If you're a non-Christian, stop wandering in the dark and acknowledge the one who is always there. Obvious, outside of the obvious takeaways in the text, there are a few things I want you to consider as we leave here today. First, recognize the strategies of the enemy. They're going to make every appeal to get all your senses, to all your senses, and even to faulty logic. They want to confuse you and make you think, it's okay, this isn't a big deal, it's just me, it's only once. Whatever it takes to pull you away from God, don't engage. Don't entertain it. Flee from it. Second, listen to wisdom, starting with God's word. You want to know what to do? Read this every day. The beginning of wisdom is what? Acquire wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7. If you have people investing in you, whether it be a parent or a Solomon, someone like a Solomon or a friend or a mentor, listen and consider what they say. You can't acquire wisdom if you're not listening. Next, live in wisdom. Are you in the right community? Remember, Solomon looked out from among the, what? Youths, plural. There were other people there at the start. No one ran after this guy in the story and said, wait, what are you doing? Don't do this. No one did. Are there people in your life that would go after you and keep you from calamity? They're either pulling you closer to God or closer to calamity. There's no in-between. So surround yourself, surrounding yourself with the right people is living in wisdom. And lastly, share wisdom. Share it with those younger than you. And I'm not talking about just age. I'm talking about those spiritually younger than you. Make sure your life is above reproach and share what you know and have experienced. The good, the bad. God can use all of it. Don't let it go for not. Share those things with people, with your kids, the people that you're mentoring, People in your peer group, don't let it go for naught. Share it. Invest in each other. If you don't feel like you're there, if you don't know enough, that's okay. Start here in Proverbs. Read it every day. 
it's black and white. It's right there. And you can turn around and just read it to somebody else, whether it be, again, your kid, your friend, whatever. But share wisdom. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you that um, you're in control, Lord. And thank you that all of your scripture, Lord, is God-breathed and is useful, Lord, for teaching, training, rebuking, correcting uh, in righteousness, Lord, so we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we thank you, Lord, that uh, from the start to the end, Lord, all of your scripture uh, can be useful, God, um, and can be applicable to our lives. Lord, I pray for those here today, Lord, that are heading down a, a dark way, that you would um, shine the light uh, for them, Lord, remember them, uh, help them to remember your word, Lord, and the relationships they have, Lord. Lord, if you have a friend that is uh, heading down the wrong path, Lord. Help us to have the courage to run after them, Lord, and stop them and say, what are you doing? And God, for the non-Christian perhaps here today, Lord, I pray for them, Lord, that they would um, stop wandering in the darkness and that they would reach out to you in the light today. In Christ's name we pray and believe. Amen.